from my experience and from some of the other creators as well, text posts do the best. And I think it's just because one, that's what's been happening on LinkedIn. Everything else is really new. But more than that, text is just so easy to consume wherever you are. Video, you may not be able to watch it at the time, may not be able to play it because people around or it's too noisy to hear. So like, and there's ways around that too, but text posts are a must on LinkedIn, like without a doubt. Welcome to the Marketing for the Culture podcast, powered by the African American Marketing Association. Each week, we'll bring you an insightful conversation from some of the best experts in our industry on how to advance our career. Join the collective of Black marketers across the world advancing their brand as we work towards creating a collaborative community. Hey, what's going on, everybody? What's happening? What up, though? It's your homie, C.L. Palmer, a.k.a. CZ Pod Gang. And today we are here on another edition of Marketing for the Culture with my boy, Walt Gainer II. What's going on, Walt? Yo, what's good, man? What's good? Man, I'm glad to have you here, man, because I want to take a deep dive. Well, maybe not too deep. I don't want to get all in your business, but I want to know about the LinkedIn creator program that you just wrapped up. And I also want to talk to you about some of this Spotify versus Apple <laughs> podcast saga that you brought to my attention. So, man, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you in. Um, I guess before we get into that, man, just like, tell me, like, for real, though, like, how has everything been since you had to, like, you kind of had a chance to ramp down a little bit? That's, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, it's been weird, right? Um, I I kind of made myself take a break since it was over. I was like, let me take a break from creating content, but I'm ready to get back in because it doesn't take too long for a break to become a permanent thing. So yeah. right now, like, I'm glad I'm doing this with you because like, okay, yeah, this is what it feels. This was supposed to feel like. Let me get back into this thing. Yeah, man. That, and that's kind of how I was feeling too. And I was trying to get you last night, but you said tonight would have been better. So I was like, okay, it's cool. I, at least I know I'm going to be doing something this week because right. man, like I haven't did a podcast in the last like two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And because I started a new job, I haven't made any content. So man, I was itching to get back. I was to say you had the itches like I gotta yeah, record man, something. I gotta, I gotta do something. Look at that tree. Man. Let me like, record to talk about, about that real quick. Right, yeah. man. Like man, I had the darn phone up in the car. Like I was finna do something. I just ended up listening <laughs> to some music. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing. It. Right. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know, one day though, I'm, I'm we gonna do the reality show while I'm in the car. We'll we can get that together. In the car recording, you got to do at least one of those episodes. I feel like every podcast, you got to do a. Uh, those car videos. I feel like it's required for everybody who makes content. Like it right is. now. It it's is. It's like you got to do at least one. And if you ever end up being on a reality show, that's like half the reality show, just you being in the car anyway. Thanks. So you might, might as well get to practice it. Yeah. In fact, I got a lot of car videos. In fact, I know this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but <laughs> you'll figure out. you figure that part out. That's not my job. But um, um, yeah, man, one, like just back in like 2016, 2017, 2018, listen to a lot of Gary Vee. He's like, document everything, document everything. I was like, yeah, I'm going to document everything. I wasn't doing shit except driving, but I was documenting. <laughs> and there's one video, it came back around because it was like, this is from three years ago today. And um, it was me talking about all the stuff I want to do with boss logs. And it was really cool because I was doing like 80% of it. It didn't look oh. necessarily how I wanted it to look by this time, but I was doing it and it felt good. So yeah, you got to have those car videos just for like, just for those throwback stuff. And I could take that video and flip it into some content real quick. And put it out there. So what you're saying is you did a video and you kind of manifested. On I manifested. You no, know. that's right. That's, that's real dope, man. That's I, right. I, I love to hear stories like that, man. Because you know that that was a thing that Twitter just did not that long ago. Um, oh yeah, with the billboards, yeah, right. And that was people manifesting through those tweets. Mm -hmm. and I'm just like, 
So yeah, man, you right on track, bro. Like that's why I gotta keep people like you around me. Just so I was like, it puts the pressure on me to step it up. All the way up. All the way up. Yeah, man. It's like, I've been thinking about this. Uh, I was talking to someone because I might start uh, producing someone else's show. They were saying like, yeah, we'd like you to listen to this and uh, let me know what you think. And I was like, yeah, I'll listen. I was telling him that I'm a very, um, I'm a non-perfectionist. Like, I believe in non-perfectionist progression. Or something like mm. that. I said a lot smoother on the text, but um, <laughs> because like <laughs> you could sit all day trying to make it perfect, make it work, all this stuff, but it doesn't matter. Just record it and do better next time. So for you, I'm like, yeah, you know, just do what you do now. But very next time you do something, you gotta step it up. At least that's what I'm telling myself. I need that same energy back at me. So now nah, I feel that. Absolutely, man. Well, I'm glad to hear it, man. So. I guess since we're talking about things that you have accomplished, let's go ahead and talk about the LinkedIn creator program, which, you know, at least in my feed, you are definitely a star. I don't know about everybody else's <laughs> feed, but definitely in my algorithm, you was you was getting a lot of shine. So, man, just, just kind of give me like a little brief overview about, I guess, like how you kind of got in at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, just like a little bit of like how they, you know, checked up on you. And then I guess like kind of the exit is just to share as much as you can on like, you know, everything that happened over the last, what's it been like two months? Uh, two and a half. It's been two 10 half. weeks. Two, ten yeah, weeks, so two yeah. and a half months. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And you know, this is actually my first interview since the program ended too. Oh, it's an exclusive. Exclusive. Yeah. exclusive, 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 exclusive. Um, so yeah, so all right, so LinkedIn, the platform everyone thinks of as a place to go get jobs, they um, announced last year that they're starting this creator program and investing twenty five million dollars into creators. That does not mean I got twenty five million, y'all. I did not. I did get a little bad, but nothing like that. <laughs> I'm still working, um, but. Essentially, they want to like LinkedIn is a really powerful platform for. I'm not like I said this before. I even heard of this program. They they have a lot of features that allow you to create um, without needing to hit a certain follower account to get those features first. So this program, um, they picked a hundred people who applied, who and basically asked us all to come up with a certain topic that they wanted to create about something that would have an economic impact, whether it's helping people with their career growth, entrepreneurial growth, or just anything in between. There's a lot of people talking about like mm. uh, different things regarding mental health, people doing advocacy work, people talking about the future of tech, sustainability, all these different things. And my topic was um, creating content that supports people working while Black or feeling discouraged about their career or entrepreneurial journey. And they saw that, and I guess they said, yes, we want that. And it was really cool. I did not, I wanted to get in, manifested it getting in. I remember after I applied, I was telling people like, yeah, I'm just going to act like I was already in. I started messaging people like, yeah, we got to collab when this thing happens. And then eventually like, yeah, well, once you win this thing. And hmm. yeah, I, I didn't even believe it at first for real. Like it's, uh, <laughs> I was like me, like up until the day they announced it, I was like, Hmm, did I really get in? <laughs> and then they announced it. I saw my name on there. I was like, Oh, they're for real, for real, for real, for real. So yeah, man, it's been cool. It's been cool. That's super dope, man. About yeah. to say, so they just, they shot you like an email DM. Oh, so it was a whole, it was like a for real program application and everything. So um, October, beginning of October was a deadline and we had to answer some questions, kind of pitch it for real, create a uh, 90 second video, which 90 seconds could go, <laughs> could go by really quick. It's not a lot really of time. Quick. It is not. I redid that video like <laughs> at least bare minimum 30 times. <laughs> Um, man, it was stressful, but I did it and sent it in and then basically had to wait like two months, uh, before I heard anything back oh, wow. and they sent an official welcome email, which were like, don't tell a single soul. This is after I already told five people. Then I continued reading the email and I saw that I was getting ready to post and everything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they said, don't tell a single soul or we will take all of everything back and oh, kick you man. off the platform. Not really. But, um, 
You don't tell anyone until they do the official announcement in December. So it took me two months to find out. Then I had to keep it secret for another month until they uh, officially published it. So, um, yeah, it's like a 10 week program, January 10th to March 18th, posting basically every day, at least four times a week, video content. Um, they wanted video content, but I just did, you know, video, live stream, audio events, all these different things for 10 weeks, just all geared towards supporting people, supporting black people, you know, supporting us, making sure, uh, we have support systems and everything. So that was my goal, really, to use a program to build a community all around supporting uh, people like us in the workplace. Okay. So, like, what what kind of support did they give you, I guess, throughout the course? You said, like, you got a little, little, little change in your pocket. But, you know, what, what kind of, I guess, support as far as, you know, creatively guidance that they give you that you are able to share about? Yeah. So, um... They, they picked 100 people and they broke us up into groups. And my group was amazing. Like, I ended up collaborating with people outside of my subgroup, but really loved my group as well. We each have, each group has a creator manager. So, week by week, we check in with a creator manager. And then my group also had a group chat. So, we always talk in, always in there. You had to be in there all the time, else you leave, come back. There's like 500 messages. So, um, it was like constant communication, just. Talk about the highs, the lows, the wins, the mistakes, all of that stuff. And then our creator manager, someone who works for LinkedIn, is a creator himself. His name is Xander, Xander Van Gogh. Um, he's really dope, man. He's doing big things over at LinkedIn. So it was really cool to have someone who oh. is a creator themselves, familiar with the platform, and is like behind the scenes as far as decisions being made about LinkedIn, about creators, all that stuff. So basically we got um, advice with the right perspective, right? And so like after the program, I'm looking at all these people talk about ag- algorithms and stuff. And I was like, yeah, there technically is an algorithm, but you don't have to live life by it. <laughs> like only matters a little bit, really. It's consistency is the biggest factor at the end of the game. Consistency, quality, and giving people what they want. So, um, yeah, it was it was a really cool just be able to get insight and not have to guess anymore. Uh, okay. Well, that's that's pretty dope. So, basically, they had, like you said, they had y'all like in little groups. And I guess, like, were y'all doing any pitching to your creative managers or were y'all really just, like, discussing oh. ways to use the platform? Um, so it was a it was an accelerator program and they provided some tools, resources and kind of guide us on how to use it. But they were really like not just do what you already do. Do it on LinkedIn, though, you know, okay. be intentional, build community. So um, kind of a Netflix approach, not giving a whole lot of notes. Yeah, I guess I don't know about Netflix, but uh, yeah, oh. I'm not as familiar with what they do, but, well, you know, they. All right. Um, matter of fact, this this might be good because I might be alienating some people. So I'll go ahead and explain that. But when I say um, not giving a lot of notes, Netflix is notorious for working with big Hollywood, you know, directors, producers, you know, and basically just cut the check and let them do what they want. Um, mm-hmm. I know, you know, Martin Scorsese, mm-hmm. um, he did the the Irishman. Uh, on Netflix, which was like three hours long, <laughs> and it probably could have used some notes, <laughs> but that's that's not Netflix's thing. They don't give notes; mm-hmm. they just cut you the check and they say, "Bring us back something." We we like what you do already, so you just do you, and we'll we'll hold it. All right, so yeah, the Netflix approach. You know, they uh, say go out, have fun, and uh, your creator manager's there for guidance if you need it. And if they see something, they'll probably say something like one thing. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, you'll see people when they do these long text posts, there's like a whole line break for every single sentence and everything. And I was doing that because it's just like, I mean, that's how people post on LinkedIn. They pull me aside and say, yeah, all this is good, but I'm not going to hold you. You got to stop doing that. <laughs> and like, you got to chill. I don't want to read this. And I was like, yo. And I started thinking about it. And people say it makes it easier to read, but... 
when I started thinking about it a bit more, it's like, you know what? I don't think that's necessarily true. So like sometimes it's cool to have the line breaks, but other times it's like, just make the post, do it in paragraph form and like make it easy for people to read. Like books aren't line by line unless it's dialogue. Just, just make it there. So it's like things like that or just going deeper into like the psychology of how people consume content. Um, mm-hmm. Just a lot of really dope conversations. So it's like the advice that's needed when you need it or if you have a question, get some like for real guidance. So it was a, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was like, the courses you sign up for, except you don't have to question whether or not the course is valid. If the stuff's just Googleable, it's like, nah, here's someone who understands it all, can tell you about features that are awesome, features that not quite there just yet. They keep an eye on it. So kind of helped me, save me a lot of time and just really taught me about myself for real. So all right, that's that's pretty dope. So let me, I guess uh, going into that. Um, since you have fit wrapped up, what is going to be the next thing for you to incorporate when it comes to LinkedIn? Now, and I'll give you a second to think about that because one of the things that you just said was, um, doing the posts with the line breaks, but now you can kind of have your own newsletter slash blog on LinkedIn and I'm trying to figure out like so should I just be taking my posts and then publishing them on this thing or do I need to have both to be like I guess like hitting the algorithm how I want to mm. now, you I know what I've learned oh, sorry. Say, you might not have that answer but go ahead I got some answers um as far as what I'm gonna do and on also just like a little bit about like the text posts versus newsletters and all that stuff so I learned that, um, you know, everyone wants video right now. Videos performing well, TikTok's blowing up, all that stuff. From my experience and from some of the other creators as well, text posts do the best. And I think it's just because, one, that's what's been happening on LinkedIn. Everything else is really new. But more than that, text is just so easy to consume wherever you are. Video. You may not be able to watch it at the time, may not be able to play it because people around or it's too noisy to hear. So like, and there's ways around that too, but text is like without question, as long as you got Wi-Fi internet connection, even if you can't see, there's like the voice uh, accessibility feature. So text is something you could always consume. So text posts are a must on LinkedIn, like without a doubt. Um, Newsletters are pretty cool. Because you can add additional things in there. Like if you are working on podcasts, right? You could have a whole newsletter for each episode. You can embed YouTube videos. You can embed other types of content. Have links uh, going out to different things. You could embed a um, newsletter sign up link or code in there. So newsletters are pretty dynamic um, options. And people could subscribe to them. And they'll get a notification on LinkedIn and an email when... Uh, new newsletters launch. So newsletters are a great tool, but text is king there. Text is king. But video will be soon. It's not quite there yet as far as like reach yet, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't put video there. See, I I have a theory on that. And I want to say you're going to be flat out wrong, but I don't feel like... I f- let me say this. I feel like video on LinkedIn is going to have a different feel than it does on other social media platforms. I feel like eventually video will feel more like YouTube on LinkedIn than it does TikTok on LinkedIn. No, that's true. That's and- true. And I think that people, the people who are on LinkedIn for the most part, because it's a business crowd, these are most of the readers that are left in the world. There's a lot of people who read books on LinkedIn. (laughs) It's like there is a concentrated amount of people who read books and even write books. I mean, flat out on LinkedIn. And as far as what it takes to be in a certain industry, having to be up on industry news 
is a must for anybody who's actually trying to make their way in the business. So I almost feel like it's inherent with the culture of what people are coming to LinkedIn for. And I think that's why the written word does better because it's it's kind of a similar mindset with everybody. Everybody knows you kind of have to read to get the stuff that you need. And I, I don't really see that changing anytime soon. Like I feel like um in a little bit you probably gonna see more like New York Times type of uh advertising on LinkedIn. Like I feel like they're as soon as whatever their next thing is, it'll be there. Um so on Wall Street Journal, you name it. It's all, <laughs> all the all the big digital news outlets, they'll probably have some stuff. Forbes. They'll they'll be going hard here in a little bit. I I could see that coming. Um, you know, um, if you kind of have to look close sometimes, but um, LinkedIn is actually like a very editorial platform, and that's something I learned being on there. From the they have a trending section, just like all the other platforms do, but it's trending news. Right. They have their LinkedIn, like the creators who work for LinkedIn. Some of their main products or main content they create are articles and That's newsletters. Right. They they do send out like a push notification of like a news rundown almost like every day. And literally every day. So and they do they have several different types of weekly news newsletters that go well. Um it's very, very editorial based. And um video That's a good point. It's just something that everyone is going to have to integrate into whatever they're doing so i'm not sure exactly what it will look like but um it's it's definitely going to be a thing and short form video up to like three minutes it's going to be very big on linkedin at some point they already have really cool ways to use video like linkedin learning courses all video based short and long form so i think they have like an interesting type of potential like it's it's really cool like it could be like a sub app feature this kind of separate section like sometimes you like on twitter for example you hit a new tab and it's like a whole another side of twitter um it's going to be cool i don't i don't know when when it's going to happen i need it to happen now but um <laughs> it's going to be cool and as far as me and what i'm focusing on is audio events audio events and live streams um it's linkedin is very community base platform and those are two ways to really build up a community newsletters actually would be helpful for that too but those are the two things i'm focused on especially because audio events are so new think about clubhouse when they first started like similar to linkedin you know except there's a whole different type of crowd and they're hungry for it for real yeah and it's a, it's a little bit uh shall we say legit um you know it's one thing to be on instagram and you is who you say you is, but it's another thing to be on LinkedIn and try to pull something. It's like you cannot pull a fast one and say you work somewhere because I could hit somebody up and be like, hey, did that person work with you? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fraud on LinkedIn, it's it's not as easy as Clubhouse yo, or anything else. Instagram, nah. Twitter, Facebook, all that. No, we see y'all out here though. Yeah, you got for real decision makers. This one person, he started. He's a creator on LinkedIn. Um, I think a part of the program as well, and he has an audio event that's sponsored by Adobe now. So it's like the, the decision makers are there, and it wasn't wow. just some random thing. He's been creating for a long time, but right. he's scaled up, it's, man. It's so happening, yeah. That's dope, man. Shout out to the Growth Club too. Um, I'm, yes. We need to get that back popping, man. I like that was a nice little chemistry that we had, um, mm -hmm. and that kind of spawned out of an audio room. So yeah, man, we get back in the saddle with that. I think it would be dope. Uh, now I did not, of course, I haven't hosted one, but are you able to record those, or is it just does that? They don't have recording functionality. On? Yeah, they don't have the recording functionality on LinkedIn, so you got to have a outside platform just like you know clubhouse when they first started so right um yes yeah, so it's not there yet they have some like different features that are kind of cool like reaction 
options. But technically, the audio events are still, and they call it audio events, not audio rooms. But I, love that. I, I still agree. call it audio rooms. I do. It just flows better. Yeah. But um, that's yeah, um, that's a clunky name. I'm not gonna lie. Audio well, they they I think it's because um, they have a whole event a fu- functionality. Wow. And it's actually kind of interesting too, because it really taught me about experiences for real. Um, like um, when you create an event on LinkedIn, you have the option between live in person event, online event, which is like a live stream or a link out to a Zoom recording, or audio event. And it's kind of cool when you think about it that way, because okay. you can make be more intentional. Hmm. Yeah. So like the name is different, and I think it's partly because rooms was made a thing on these other platforms that came first but when you think of it that way the whole experience of bringing people together actually makes sense and it's like kind of forces you to be more intentional about some things too right making sure you're not wasting people's time it's not just a room for someone to walk into this is an event you know people coming here to learn get something like takeaways they're not here to waste time let's talk about nothing they're here to Gain some insight so they can level up. Absolutely, man. And that's definitely something that I have taken away uh, from all the rooms that I've had the pleasure of participating in. You know, shout out to everybody that's come through and dropped some jewels. Uh, it's all needed, man. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm going to take a little break. But once again, Walt, Congratulations to you. Very proud of everything you did so far. Thank you, man. Thank you. man. I've been proud to be a part of it. You know, you come through, ask me a couple questions. Like, bro, I'm right here for you, whatever. Um, so, man, whatever the next thing is, I'm, I'm definitely going to be right here with you, man. So, sure, man, you, you definitely there. Which, yeah, you, you're part of it for real. Part of it. So, appreciate you. Appreciate you, everything you do um, on the camera, off camera, all of it, man. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a quick break. And then we come back. We're going to talk about Spotify and Apple. All right, y'all. Welcome back to Marketing for the Culture. It's your boy, CL Pod Gang, a.k.a. CZ Pod Gang. Back with my boy, Walt Gang at the second. And uh, we're going to talk about Apple and Spotify making a little news on the podcast front. You know, what good would a podcast be with the podcast without having a podcast topic. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh you brought some of this up to my attention and Spotify just came out and made a bold statement saying that they have more US podcast listeners than Apple, which it the numbers are according to them, but we'll get into the intricacies of that in a moment. But I want to couple that with another story where Apple is actually letting their podcast hosts or managers look at their follower numbers in their analytics. And I think that's a couple things that's interesting about that because of some of the moves that Spotify just made buying apps like Chartable and so on. So I guess to bring it full circle uh, to start, Spotify really has jumped out here on the front of buying up the entire podcast industry as fast as possible. And we were talking offline about how Apple didn't step up to the plate and grab some of this territory. And you know, I they have a lot of money in the bank. I'm I'm a little surprised that they weren't in on it myself. But um Spotify really has come on strong, especially with a lot of their exclusives, uh, and even them saying, well, the CEO in the Q and A said that they they really focused on bringing the listeners, the podcasters, and the advertisers together, and that's the thing that's helped them grow. So I guess let me ask you this. Are are you buying it? That Do you really feel like people are going to Spotify for podcasts from the things that you hear? Because, you know, we're on the other side. I know me, myself, 
I'm not the biggest fan of the Apple Podcast app, but because that's where I started, it's kind of where I'm at. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, what what do you what do you, what's your first impressions of of that news? Because you you was feeling kind of like me. Yeah, when I heard uh, when Spotify said they got more users, more podcast listeners in the U.S., I was like, really? You sure? Like, what 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 are the stats? Where are you getting those stats? And let me see some other stats as well. Just because, like, Apple, from what I've seen, Apple is still number one. The analytics I've seen, they still top place where people are listening to shows. Like, Apple has a advantage, has one advantage where, you know, they pre-install the app on every single iPhone. Spotify, their advantage is they already have a whole customer-based user base because of music. And so they just added podcasts into there. But... I see people sharing links to share an Apple podcast. I do see some people listening on Spotify, but for the most part, this is like Apple podcast or some other type of player like uh, pocket cast, cast box, even stitcher to be honest, Google podcast, YouTube. But those are the places I hear people talking about like Spotify is doing a lot is in everyone's face and they do have exclusive shows which means you can only listen on that platform but i still don't uh i don't see i feel like apple i don't think that apple is threatened by spotify to be honest i feel like it's almost like apple Podcasts and spotify spotify like the the little brother that's like making all this noise doing all these things and apple's just like chilling there like okay oh you in this podcast thing too okay that's cool you go ahead have fun yeah, have fun. That's what it feels like. Uh-huh. But with that being said, I can't like ignore Spotify because they doing a lot to make it easier for creators, like acquiring Anchor. Um, they're also very innovative, or at least a bit more outspoken about their innovations, like a video podcast, which video podcast isn't new. They're not the first to do it, but it's the first podcast listening platform I've noticed that has adopted video. So um, the only thing is, like, it seems to be exclusive first, and then they roll it out. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few years. I think Apple has a few things up their sleeve, but Spotify is coming through swinging hard, trying to make all the noise, trying to get everyone's attention. Absolutely. And one thing that you just hit on was the video part. And I think that right there letting it's the people who are using anchor who have the ability to upload video Mm -hmm. i think and for them to have the same opportunity to make money off rip uh because of impressions from the audio and video side actually gives it a small advantage over youtube because youtube you have to get to a thousand subscribers yep with anchor you're monetizing day one and i i think that's important for people who are just getting into the podcast game uh, but i also want to be careful because it's like that's a lot of control to give to one company over your platform and i think whether or not apple decides to start adopting some of those same uh, platform features will be remain to be seen because you could look at it one way or two ways. You could look at it like Apple kind of doesn't need to get into that game, but also if they want to, you know, keep up with the the Joneses, keep up with Spotify and what they're doing, they they might have to go ahead and start developing something. And one thing I do know about Apple is they're never the first ones to do anything. But they're always the first ones to perfect it. So I'm always like keeping an eye out. Like y'all might not be doing it now, but when y'all drop it, it might have everything and more. And I think Apple, yeah. because Apple's Apple's whole business model is direct to consumer and basically making you pay for everything up front, you know, via transactions through their platforms. Mm-hmm. You know, Spotify is a, a software company. 
and they're expanding things that they could do in software. You know, so like the the way that they get down is a little different. So that I always have to take that into consideration when I'm being critical of companies like Apple. It's like that's not really their thing. Their thing is making the best hardware and then getting you into the ecosystem so you spend money on the apps, the videos, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. The podcast is just, you know, it's a new thing for them to start yeah. charging money for a premium access. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because they're not even the first for that either. I think there's definitely been a lot of podcast hosts. Um, I want to say which one, I don't remember which one it is, but I remember when pot- Apple announced premium podcast this platform was like yeah that's cool we've been doing this and we're still doing it with creators in mind and i think that's like another difference like apple is like yeah come use our tools and now i hear them changing some language to be creator focused everyone's talking about supporting creators now but there's still a few platforms that really are creator focused you're right. Like right. Apple, they want their money <laughs> they want their money they want you to keep they want to keep you on their platform just like everyone else, to be honest, Facebook, all them things. Like, right. yeah. So it'll be interesting for real. Um, just to see if that stays true. I know Spotify has some deal with Facebook or Meta um, or their whole listening user experience as well. Um, so Spotify is making a lot of good decisions as far as like making it easier to listen to Spotify where you are, but and also Apple has this whole battle with all these other platforms because of their app marketplace as well. So it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out. Like, will Spotify stay at majority of U.S. podcast listeners? Will it start to grow even more than there? How will the international audience be affected by this? It'll, I'm curious, man. I'm curious. Yeah. Well, they they uh, source Edison Research, which is a reputable company as part of the way they were able to say that. Uh, I think the the one thing that I will say is I haven't been pushing people to listen to my podcast on Spotify per se, but I am using Spotify to promote the podcast. And also I've been using Spotify to embed my podcast into blog posts. And I think I prefer to do that only because the interface is very familiar. When you start using like the your native podcast app, it always looks a little different. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of started just floating toward using Spotify for that. And then also the ability to share the podcast, on at least on Instagram and Facebook, but directly to your story for people to click on and go and listen. And I don't think I'm able to do that with Apple. It's It's different. I know what you're talking about, actually. I know what you're talking about because they have it set up, some type of their integration so that when you do share it to your story, it has a whole different display and feel versus Apple. You'd have to do the whole like click link to go type of thing. That's a good point. The shareability on at Spotify is definitely there. It's, um, it's super user but, friendly. Yeah, Apple. I feel like is concerned about iPhone users only. That's one difference. But I will say at the same time, a lot of Apple users use Apple Music and not Spotify as well. So there's still like some friction. But app to app wise, definitely, definitely there. One cool thing I noticed that Apple's done is have a whole section. In Apple Podcasts, for if you share an Apple Podcast, it's, it's like you, because you've done it before. You sent me a podcast from Apple, and I open my app, and I see a section there like, yo, shared by CEO. I have the same thing on my end, too. I do like yeah. that as well, because even though I have not listened to that podcast every time, I will actually go and listen to that podcast from time to time. And so that does that does something. I'm not quite sure what the... Um, psychology is behind that or why that works the way it does but it's like less clicks does the thinking for you that browse section it tells you what's new things you should check out that's and that's apple's whole thing is like making it user-friendly so you don't have to think you just do 
Spotify, still got to navigate around a few places to get two podcasts. It's like they're putting everything all in one, which is cool for like just everything all in one, but it's just more clicks and everything to get to what you want. So it's yeah. interesting, the whole psychology behind it. I would love to sit down with the design team with both. Oh, the UX team right. actually for both to really see what kind of decisions were being made. But yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting battle between the two, like Apple Podcasts, uh saying they're gonna let people see follower accounts. I think that's coming in April. That's gonna be huge because <laughs> for years everyone's been like saying, Oh, I got this many followers on Apple, but that's all been lies. Like if anyone's been saying that previously. They're just guessing based on ratings, reviews, or followers on Instagram, not followers on Apple. So that's going to shake up the game a lot. It's going to expose some things. And then I think for a while, then people are going to get a feel for it and be like, okay, this is what it is. It's going to be interesting to see how the whole like social media minus stuff starts to apply to podcasts with like true follower account numbers. I'll say this. I it's a step in a direction that we actually want to go in, which is getting some first party data. And if this is going to be the first step in getting first party data, then it's great. But if this is the only thing we're going to get, then I don't think it's going to mean as much as it should, because the I guess going back to uh, the the premium subscriber, that part of it will be a little bit more. Uh, it'll be a little bit more insightful for them, because it'll tell you between the people you have subscribed overall versus the people you have for the premium and then you might be able to figure out like what like what did, what are these people doing like you might be able to figure some things out like okay how can I get more people to come to the premium side mm-hmm. or how can I convert them to start you know joining my email list or whatever there might be something to that but again we need more data we need to know where these people are coming from. You know, are they listening to any other things that we're doing? And of course, none of these platforms are talking to each other. And so at the end of the day, the only thing, the only first party data you can ever get is really from your email subscriptions. Um, anything else, you just guessing. Just but, guessing. But it would be nice to know that if I shared a link on Twitter that I got, you know, four or five listens or downloads, then I might feel like, oh, okay, maybe I need to jump on Twitter a little bit more. It would just <laughs> help have a little bit more direction. Yeah. And that's part of why I send uh links for my podcast host. Right. And even then, you still don't really get a lot. It gives you some. It gives you some of the referrals. But it don't be as clear as you would like. So, Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I could get off on the soapbox when it comes to podcast data, man, because... It's it's like the... It's it's like they have all of the information, but they don't reveal it. And that's what sucks. That's what's annoying. Right. It's it's like... uh, And it's not like they're hiding it behind a paywall they just don't provide it at all like they give you demographics like as far as where people are in the world the country the state the city province all of that but (laughs) other than that there's, there's not much there and that's why like even with apple revealing follower accounts and like that you're right like you can't just put everything on apple like Really, podcasters shouldn't just go by the podcast stats. You also really need things. Like you said, the email list, your um, SMS text list, um, Mighty Networks community. Like, there's all different things like that oh, podcasters need to have. You know? Yeah, man. And 
this this is going to be more of them trying to compete for the attention of the patreons of the world um maybe maybe even fan base um but those type of platforms where you're using your content to monetize is a whole new platform and i think they want in and they I, they want as much as possible um uh, 30% to be exact. So I, and then again, their thing is like, we're Apple. But the thing that they don't have is the integrations, which things like Patreon, where you can integrate your discords and all these other apps. So you can give a well-rounded experience. It's still like a bit of a stretch for a lot of people to just brush the Apple because you can make the money. And I think this is the, their thing is they're working with publishing companies to make the money versus creators who are trying to build a community. And I think that's the big difference that, that Apple has, has showed me. Cause when I look at who has the premium podcast, their, their media arms, you know, they they have an entire department. They do some type of journalism and it makes sense. It's like, oh, it's almost like subscribing to a newspaper. Mm -hmm. But it's a bunch of podcasts instead of a newspaper. I mean, versus, you know, you and me being on Patreon, we drop some exclusive content. We might do some live stuff. Uh to have a discord channel where we chat with fans, you know, that's all community building stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's I'm curious to see how this is going to turn out though. Like, are they going to float toward that direction or are they going to just stay with the, the publishing arm of things? Cause it's cool. also, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's funny. Cause uh, when you say that it also makes me think like, who's, who's the target market? And why as well? Because you're right, most of the uh, subscriptions that I see promoted and pushed are from Marvel, New York Times, um, uh, podcast studios. These are the right. people creating these things. I'm sure other people are as well, but it, it's kind of different. Like these companies, uh, they have a goal and it's to drive more, re uh, generate more revenue. Like you see it when you visit, like, Bloomberg and all these news sites. You get a little bit and then you got to pay for the rest. And that's what they're doing exactly. with podcasting too. I'm not mad at it. I am annoyed though. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, for creators, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit different because um, you can do that and be fine. But I think a lot of creators who are still on the rise, like myself, um, community is where it's at. I should be the focus because that can take you farther. It, it, I won't say further directly, but I know for me, it it's it's going to take me further because that's what I'm trying to build for its community. And I think other people who want to build something for a group of people or build something where other could join in and enjoy as well, then community should be the main focus. And there's ways, to, definitely ways to monetize a community, but it doesn't necessarily mean premium podcasts on Apple. There's just other ways to do it. I still have premium features and stuff like that. So, right, right, and I, I want to see Apple just do something in that direction, and I feel like people will start floating toward that direction. But like, like I was there earlier, their their whole thing is their the transaction. They're they're not the community thing. Their their community is the people who love Apple. You know, which I'm included in that community. Because <laughs> I really fools with Apple. I ain't going front, man. They, they, Have you paid for a podcast yet? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know who has a podcast that I would pay for right now. Um, and well, I take that back. I do pay for one podcast or one mm -hmm. podcast network, but not on Apple. It's on Patreon. Mm, okay, yeah. And yeah. Uh, that is Count the Dings. 
Um, shout out Jay Hoy, whole bomb network, uh, Mina Hassan, Zach Harper, all them. And only because like I really support what they doing. Like I remember like all them dudes was doing a podcast at ESPN. They got laid off. They started a company. Then somebody ran off with the money from the company, end up having to start another company again. And they end up getting bought by the Athletic. And as we know, the Athletic just got bought by the New York Times. Damn. So you got that side of things. And then you also kind of got the their developing arm, which I'm trying to support as well, because it's important for me to be a part of that community because I was there from the jump. And so when I wasn't paying, I was like, yo, I felt like I was missing out. Mm. So I had to, and that's I had to, that's it right there. It's yeah. the missing out. It's that that FOMO for real. Not yeah. even FOMO. It's like you literally are missing out. This whole other uh, this whole other conversation and vibe going on, and that's that's the feeling we got to create. And I feel like I honestly feel like with the Apple uh, podcast, I haven't felt that feeling yet, and that may just be uh who i'm listening to type of thing but still the fact is i haven't felt it where on patreon i feel it every time i see a patreon page so yeah it's a you know whole different feel there there is um there oh is... no real quick um I, I gotta wrap up soon too are you good man because this, this is about time but i wanted to see what was i can't even remember the name of the podcast. Okay, so oh the fiasco. I did kind of want to listen to this. So it's it's a luminary podcast. Ooh. Okay. And I started I wanted to listen to this one particular one and I was like five dollars for a month. And I was like maybe, maybe when I'm ready. It's not it's it's not that crucial. And I think because there's so many free podcasts, it'd be a while before I get to it. Yeah. That you know, someone actually this is probably why I had this mindset as well. When I was first starting my show, someone told me like you could go to Patreon, charge five dollars, but people are gonna expect a lot for that five dollars. So if anything, if you wanna create a community, charge more or just uh just don't don't do it for make like monetize your show in other ways. And I think that I have that stuck in my head as well. Like I think part of why we see shows like Marvel and everything have, I guess, successful premium podcasts is because they got a lot to put into it. But they, got a whole uh, brand. For, they have a whole brand they have for all these different shows and everything that support the whole experience. And uh I'm a big Marvel person, so I do feel like I'm missing out a little bit, but at the same time, I haven't even thought about subscribing for real because, like you said, there's there's other free shows out there, and I haven't felt the need to do it. And if I'm paying for it, I'm gonna expect a lot. <laughs> like I want access. I want to be able to shake hands with everyone there. So, um, no, nah, I feel that. Yeah, man. I I'm still up and down about some of this stuff, but like, Mar- like you said, Marvel is a, is a brand name. It's already been proven people pay for that. So for them to charge a podcast, it's like you already you buy the shirts, you go to the movies, you got Disney Plus, um, you buy the games, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna spend five dollars on this podcast. It's like when you in, yep. you in. So yeah, man. Right. But man, it's gonna be interesting to see where this game goes in the next couple months, but really couple years. Uh, right. I, I really, I would like to see the democratization of dynamic ad insertion. That to me is the game changer that's helping Anchor keep a chokehold on the game. I, I won't say they got a super big market share, but if we could start getting that push down, if I could not have to have. 2,000, 3,000, whatever the number is, if I could just start day one with some dynamic ad insertion, I think whoever decides to go into that route, they're going to do a little bit better. They'll be able to compete with Spotify or you know, whatever they're doing. Mm, yeah. You know, I'll be honest. I think that that's coming a lot sooner because... Uh, I hope so. 
a like dynamic ad insertion, it's um let's speak on it briefly, but um it's something like the podcast host I use is Captivate. They allow dynamic ad insertion. I could do it on any of my shows and they're working on um adding in the ad side of things so that other companies looking to sponsor shows, you can kind of sign up for that. So it's at least that's what I've heard. Um, and I don't know when it's coming, but I, I think the democratization of it is here. It's just depending on who who you're rolling with for real. Mm. So it is it's okay. it's, it's right. here. It looks everyone has a little piece of it, right? Um, but I think one common thread I'm seeing is that there will still be gatekeepers as far as like needing like two thousand this, ten thousand that, but there's other platforms. They're like, nah, your creator, go in and have that. LinkedIn, for example, we talked about LinkedIn earlier. A lot of those features, those are things that if Instagram had them, you would need 10K followers or something like that to Mm. have access to. But nah. Yes, what's here? It's here. Okay, so quick note, and then I'm going to let you go. So what I'm looking for when I say the democratization, I mean really on the technology. You know, not so much getting the advertisers uh, to participate with you. But if I can utilize a platform, say like Podcorn, um, which lets you basically bid on people's um, advertising budget for your podcast. And if I could make an ad for that Podcorn slot, and dynamically add it into my podcast, I might be able to charge a little bit more. Or maybe I might want to do some local targeting because even though my podcast is all over the world, I'm based in Atlanta and I want to do some advertising with some local brands. So I might reach out and be like, hey, I got an episode with Ryan Cameron or Trey Young, you know. Mm -hmm. You want to jump on this this episode and maybe you could be on a couple more in that little package. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That to me will start changing everything. Yeah. So like what, what Spotify has in reserve. Not what they give you on Anchor, but what they right. got for their Spotify originals. Yeah, right. I feel what, that. What what could I do with that? But that's I feel thing. that. We, we're going to talk about that a little bit more because you need to tell about that Captivate. Oh, um, Yeah. Yeah, we got to do a whole session. I'm I'm really big on that, so I was happy to jump into that one. Absolutely, man. But I appreciate you coming on, man, taking some time out. I know the the, the old ladies, they ready for us to go ahead and, and uh, <laughs> part of the night. But, man, right. you, you, you've been a real, real G hanging out with me, man. Um, anything else you want to pump before you get up out of here? No, nah, man, I'm just here for the love of it, man. Keep following that's what I like for the culture. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. And I ain't even talking about it, Bert, but May 12th, Marketing for the Culture Summit. Mm-hmm. Both of these people on this podcast will be in the building, along with a that's lot right. more of the best and brightest of the creator community. We're going to be talking about monetizing content. So you got to be on the lookout. We're going to be right here making it happen, man. But uh, thank y'all for listening. And uh, we out here. Peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to Marketing for the Culture podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe, whether it's on Apple, Google, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And of course, our videos are on YouTube. If you have a moment, feel free to give us a rate, review, or just comment. We appreciate our sponsors for their continuous support. Also, if you're interested in learning more about our sponsors or becoming a member of the African American Marketing Association, visit aa-ma.org.